Welcome to our roundtable discussion, which is also a book launch for The Water Defenders, How Ordinary People Saved a Country from Corporate Greed, just out from Beacon Press in the United States, with a Spanish translation coming as well. We are honored to have with us the book's authors, Robin Broad and John Cavana. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. And by our presence here, we have assumed the obligation to respect and care for the land and water and all that dwells in and on it, and like us, depends on it for sustenance, both material and immaterial. By our presence here, we have also assumed the obligation to do this in respectful collaboration with the original peoples whose knowledge, culture, and language are tied to this territory. I would also like to thank the organizations that have endorsed and supported this event. There are a lot of them, so we'll post a list in the chat in the Zoom here. So, my name is Jamie Neen, and I will be your host for this discussion. I work with Mining Watch Canada, one of the groups that was part of the international solidarity effort that supported the communities and groups in El Salvador that fought to protect their lands and waters from gold mining and won, eventually even winning the world's first national ban on large-scale metal mining. It was a tough struggle, fought with manipulation and violence by pro-mining interests and by the communities and organizations with public education, public participation, and solidarity on many levels, from the local to the international. And that's what brings us together today the wish to celebrate those achievements, but also to understand how they were possible and how we can build on them in all of our struggles for a better world. But we also want to honor and commemorate the immense cost of the struggle for those who sought only to defend their communities, their livelihoods and their water from destruction for the sake of short-term profit for mining investors and executives. While we gained important knowledge and built important relationships, many people were also forced to turn away from their families and their regular lives to engage in this fight. And it cost precious, irreplaceable lives. It was 12 years ago that Marcelo Rivera was disappeared, his body found 12 days later, and more assassinations followed. Ramiro Rivera, Dora Sorto, and Juan Francisco Duran. We honor and commemorate their lives, and we dedicate this event to them and those close to them but we also carry their example and dedicate ourselves to learning, to humor, and to celebrating life. We will try to keep the opening presentations very brief so as to have lots of space for discussion. So please feel free to make comments in the chat or post questions in the Q&A, which is accessible from the button at the bottom of your screen. Also, since some of the event will be in Spanish, there is simultaneous interpretation and it's accessible from the little globe icon at the bottom of the screen. Simply click on that button and then choose which audio channel you want from the pop-up menu. So to get underway, first, I'd like to ask one of the book's authors, Robin Broad, to read some excerpts from the book. Robin is an expert in international development and was awarded a prestigious Guggenheim Fellowship for her work around mining in El Salvador. She's a professor at American University in Washington, DC, and she's been in involved with the work in El Salvador since 2009, and has also lived and worked with groups in the Philippines for over four decades. So Robin, over to you. It's a, it's a true pleasure to be here tonight. A, a special shout out to Jamie, to Viviana, and to the Mining Watch team that have gone, who have gone far beyond the call of duty in putting this event together this evening. Also to Vidalina, without whom we would not be here tonight celebrating these two victories. My co-author and husband, John, and I could not be more humbled than by the presence of all the panelists, and so too by the presence of so many of you attending this event. As we planned for tonight, we decided that the best way to open this conversation on, on lessons from this international work was to get you into the story in much the same way that John and I got into it. So I'm going to read for about 10 minutes from the introduc introduction to the Water Defenders. 
For nearly two weeks, Marcelo Rivera's family could not find him. Then, on June 29, 2009, they received the phone call they had been dreading. The anonymous caller was brief. There was a body in an old abandoned well just west of the Rivero hometown of San Isidro Cabanas. The well was near the spot where Marcelo had last been seen some 12 days earlier, getting off the bus at a turnoff to the capital city. During those 12 days, Marcelo's family and friends had been at wit's end, frantically searching, desperately searching for him. They had spread news of his disappearance to all the barrios of San Isidro and nearby towns. They had even called the police for over a week to no avail. The Rivera family had, had filed a formal complaint with the country's attorney general, pleading for him to conduct a search and an investigation into Marcelo's disappearance. But another poor person gone missing up in the rural north meant little to the authorities. After the anonymous tip to Marcelo's family, the police finally acted. They pulled the remains of a body out of the dry 30 meter deep well. So extensive was the torture that the body was unrecognizable. The face was grotesquely disfigured. No jaw, no lips, no nose. The fingernails had been ripped off. The testicles bound. The trachea had been broken with a nylon cord. In the assessment of the coroner, the death had been caused by asphyxiation. The public prosecutor disagreed, concluding that the death had come from blows to the head by a hammer. Thus, Marcelo Rivera became the first of several water defenders, defenders to be assassinated in the 21st century fight over mining in Northern El Salvador. Though John and I had never met Marcelo, we have been haunted by him and the circumstances of his death ever since. Who killed Marcelo and why? Perhaps you know the difference between a tortilla and a pupusa. Or perhaps, like we had done, you are entering this story without a clue. Perhaps El Salvador is not even on your radar screen. Or perhaps El Salvador is on your radar screen only because of gangs or immigrants who trek north. But really, that does not matter. Certainly on one level, this is a story about El Salvador. At the same time, it is not just about El Salvador. This is a David versus Goliath story about a battle between a country and a foreign mining company. But it is also about how global corporations, be they big gold or big pharma or big tobacco or big oil or big banks, move into poorer communities in countries all over the world. Marcelo's story, before and after his murder, is about the struggle for clean and affordable water everywhere. It is also a story about workers and communities defending their air and land, their health and their climate, and their rights to defend themselves against corporate incursion. About how to prioritize those rights and the common good versus the usual prioritization of the profits of big corporations and their owners. It is certainly a story about gold and when and why we should leave it in the ground. But it could be about coal or natural gas or other fossil fuels about whether we measure progress in aggregate financial terms or through the well being of people and the planet about who gets to make the decisions that affect our lives. To say that the water defender's story versus that of big gold holds keys to reversing the outsized power of global corporations today is not an exaggeration. You may find yourself surprised by the relevance of the strategies of the water defenders in El Salvador, whether your focus is on a Walmart in Washington DC, a fracking company trying to expand in Texas or Pennsylvania, or petrochemical companies outside New Orleans. Along the way, however cliched the quote attributed to Margaret Mead may have become, you may also find yourself inspired by a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens who stand up to corporate power. We first heard of Marcelo in May 2009, just a month before his murder. He was a 37-year-old teacher who directed his hometown's cultural center, an avid reader, a person who loved the theater and the art, and a good practical joke. We heard his name because he was a leader of the main coalition of Salvadoran groups 
opposed to mining, the National Roundtable on Mining in El Salvador, or La Mesa. The roundtable was not well known outside of El Salvador then, but we learned of it because the group had been chosen to receive a prestigious human rights award from the Institute for Policy Studies, where John works. In 2009, the Institute selected the roundtable to honor the roundtable's opposition to mining companies eager to exploit the gold deposits near El Salvador's major river. On a warm night in October 2009, just months after Marcelo's body was pulled from that well, hundreds gathered at the National Press Club in downtown Washington, DC to meet and applaud the Salvadoran water defenders. Among them was Marcelo's youngest brother and best friend, Miguel. Miguel had come in his brother's place. Grief marked his face. Accepting the award on behalf of Miguel and the three other La Mesa leaders was a farmer and community leader from the heart of gold country, Vidalina Morales. Vidalina looked small behind the podium. She at first appeared hesitant, nervous before the large audience, fragile even. Then she began to speak. Her words filled the auditorium almost as though she did not need the microphone. For nearly 20 minutes, Vidalina held the crowd spellbound as she relayed the saga of El Salvador's water defenders standing up to big gold. The Lemper River, she explained, winds through the country like a snake, providing water for over half the population, water for drinking, water for fishing, for farming, water for the cities, as well as the rural population. But the project of the Canadian headquartered Pacific Rim Mining Corporation at its proposed El Dorado site in Miguel and Marcelo's hometown posed serious threats to the Lempa River. Key among the dangers was the toxic cyanide that Pac Rim would use to separate the gold from the rock. Vidalina ended her acceptance speech with a seemingly audacious demand that the government of El Salvador stand up to giant mining firms and choose water over gold by banning the mining of all metals, all metals. Before this, she had urged the audience to follow a related legal thriller unfolding four blocks away to the west of where we sat, just past the White House, at the site of a little known tribunal in Washington. There, as Vidalina explained, Pacrim had filed a lawsuit against the government of El Salvador right before Marcelo's murder. Pacrim claimed that El Salvador had either to allow it to mine or to pay it over $300 million in costs and foregone profits from future mining. Vidalina invoked the upside down world summoned by Uruguayan writer Eduardo Guiliano in asking why it was not El Salvador suing a pack rim, since the mining company threatened the water and well being of her country. But that upside down world is the reality of global corporate power and economic rules that affect people around the globe. And as we think back to that evening, we must admit that we each separately and silently found it just as far fetched to imagine a national legislature passing a law to end mining as it was to conceive of this tribunal siding with Vidalina and the rest of the water defenders. At the reception following the award ceremony, we huddled with Marcelo's brother, Miguel. Miguel was soft spoken and gentle in his manner, understandably a bit shy as he asked for help. After all, we had just met. He seemed both incredibly focused on the detail of what to do next and incredibly shell-shocked by the chain of events, by his brother's murder and the lawsuit. But his appeal was urgent, direct, and heartfelt. We don't know this tribunal or how it works. We don't know what to expect. Can you help us find out about this lawsuit? On that balmy evening in October 2009, who could have guessed that Miguel's questions and Vidalina's call to action would pull us to and thousands of others around the world 
into the vortex of three interrelated unknowns for nearly a decade to come. First, there was the on the ground mystery. Who killed Marcelo Rivera and why? Not just who carried out the brutal killing, but who was the mastermind? Second, there was the mystery at the national level. Could El Salvador possibly become the first nation on earth to ban mining? Or at least to move closer in that goal, to that goal? And finally, the global thriller. Could little El Salvador possibly prevail against the gold mining industry in Washington, DC at that World Bank court? Thank you. Thank you, Robin. That was marvelous. It's a, it's a, it's an amazing story, um, but it's also Jamie, amazing. Jamie, we're writing. not hearing you. Um, oh, I am unmuted. Oh, wait, I don't. You should be able to hear me. Sorry, got yeah. it. Beautiful. Okay. So, yeah. So, thank you, thank you, Robin. Um, I'd like to turn now to the books other author, John Cavana, for his observations on what makes this story so important, especially when it comes to building successful relationships of trust, respect, and real solidarity across borders and institutions. John has just stepped down as director to become a senior advisor of the Washington DC-based Institute for Policy Studies, an organization that collaborates with the Poor People's Campaign and other social movements to turn ideas into action for peace, justice, and the environment. Previously, he worked with the United Nations to research corporate power. So John, what would you say are the really key lessons on this kind of international solidarity work that you've highlighted in the book? Great, thanks so much, Jamie, and all of you from Mining Watch, and Robin and I, and also Manuel, Jen, the others here are so excited by all the people who've joined tonight from Canada, from the US, from El Salvador. We have people here from Ecuador, from Mexico, from all over, um, many of whom contributed to these amazing victories, including old friends in all of these countries who go for Robin and me way back, some of you four decades to work on Chile, on Central America, on NAFTA and elsewhere. So tonight, is a celebration of all of you and we've and all that we've accomplished together and all that we'll win in the future. But as Jamie has hinted at, we'll win more in the future if we absorb the lessons of this successful fight. So hooray for this discussion. A quick word on Robin's three mysteries. So first, no, we do still not know the intellectual author, the mastermind of Marcelo's assassination and so we honor him tonight and the others who've been killed. Um, so that's the first. The second, yes, miraculously on the lawsuit in October 2016, there was a unanimous decision against the mining company uh, and ordering them to pay $8 million to El Salvador. And countries almost never win in this tribunal, so that is remarkable. And finally, third, yes, on the on on uh, Vidalina's audacious uh, request in March 2017, El Salvador did become the first nation on earth to ban mining, to save its rivers in a unanimous vote in the Salvadoran legislature. So, <laughs> and I don't know for the rest of you, but these are are the two biggest wins together certainly in my, in my life of, of something I've been involved in. So how did this come about? And in the book, after talking with dozens of you, we concluded that there were three main reasons. And I won't go into details, but just to say them. First, um, amazing on the ground organizing in the North and El Salvador and mining country. Also educate some of the most creative education of community members. Marcelo was a genius at this, but so were many others. And then the building of a, of a robust national coalition, the National Roundtable Against Mining in El Salvador. So that's a precondition to most wins. Second thing, and this Vitalina always um, emphasized to us, the framing of this fight wasn't so much anti-mining. 
it was largely presented to the public in a positive light. Water is life. It was a fight for water, for clean water in El Salvador, and um, with slogans like, we can live without gold, but we can't live without water. Very hard to be against water. <laughs> so we, we die without it in, in three and a half days. So that, that was very important to the win. Um, and finally, third, pulling, pulling in every possible available ally, both nationally, but then as we get into the conversation tonight, you'll learn more about this group of international allies that was put together with the help of Mining Watch Canada, the Institute for Policy Studies and others that pulled in labor unions. By the end, we had the International Confederation of, of Trade Unions with its 180 million members, environmental groups, women's groups, faith groups from all over, solidarity groups, the El Salvador diaspora in Canada, you'll hear more about that and also in the United States. So pulling in every available ally, but also pulling in unlikely allies. And here, the water defenders on the ground in El Salvador were incredibly brave. For example, they reached out to two rather conservative archbishops of San Salvador, won them both over. They both became a key part of this win. They reached out to people in the hated right-wing Arena Party, some of whom also came along uh, to support uh, these demands. So that, that's overall. Now, just one final word, let me say, before we, we turn to this bigger panel. On the international solidarity work, we spend a whole chapter, chapter five, <laughs> starting with the World Bank, a big demonstration outside the World Bank with our famous fat cat, inflatable balloon, but the whole, all of chapter five is lessons. I just want to end with one, which maybe will be obvious to many of you who do international work, which is, I feel like the international allies and the national round table on the ground in El Salvador were very clear on a division of labor. On the ground in El Salvador, La Mesa, the, the national round table led, obviously on the campaign there, on the education there, and on the work with the national government, the national legislature to try to pass a ban on mining. They led there, we supported. In the international side, we did the two things that we could do better from outside. We did research on and action against the mining company, first Pacific Rim in Canada, and then it was eaten up by this larger Oceana Gold in Australian Canadian company. So terrific work on, and at those companies. And then of course, we did the work, much of the work around this international tribunal in Washington uh, based in the World Bank. So we led on that and they supported. We did very good communications among us. You'll meet Jan Morrill later, who was one of the liaison people. We now have Pedro Cabezas helping with communication between the two. And finally, we kept money out of the equation. This was not a relationship based on money coming from the North to the South. It was a relationship based on great trust that was built over a lot of visits. Vidalina, many of you have met because she's come to Canada and the United States. Uh, lots of people came from these countries down to El Salvador. And um, we focused on work and trust and relationships, not on money. So that's a big one. Back to you, Jamie. Thank you, John. Thank you. That was that was excellent. And and I hope at some point we get to see pictures of the fat cat because it's the the uh, the stop the suits campaign was was brilliant on a number of levels. And I think we've got. I think Manuel will share there. some of those. Folks. Yeah, I think I think that's part of Manuel's section. Thanks. Um, so now we would like to bring you the perspective from the ground from the Department of Cabanas in El Salvador. Vitalina Morales is an activist. We've heard about her already from, from Robin. She's a human rights defender, and she's the president of the Economic and Social Development Association in Cabañas, uh, also known as EDES, the Asociación de Desarrollo Económico Social. Vitalina has been a central part of the struggle to keep gold mining out of El Salvador, and she will be speaking in Spanish. So if you need 
English interpretation, please make sure to select the English channel from the interpretation, the little globe at the bottom of your screen. Voy a invitar a Vidalina. Que hable. I'm going to invite Vidalina to speak now. Vidalina, puedes poner tu cámara. Vidalina, can you turn your camera on? And your mic? Okay, thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you and good evening to you all. Everyone connected, logged on for uh, this event uh, at a late hour, uh, particularly on the East Coast. It's earlier here where I am. Well, Robin and John have already said uh, pretty much everything there is to say, and very emotionally, uh, I feel a lot of mixed feelings when I hear Robin read from the book. It reflects what we lived and experienced in El Salvador, very difficult moments during our struggle as we have said before, it was a struggle of David against Goliath. We know, uh, frankly speaking, the capacity that large corporations have, the art they have to, uh, to trick and manipulate uh, decision makers and politicians. And we experienced that in the years 2005 to, uh, well, all the, all the way through the period where they were uh, arriving and settling in in Cabañas, in our area of El Salvador. And I would like to uh, concentrate my comments, perhaps repeat some things that Robin and John have mentioned. I really appreciate these two human beings. They are wonderful uh, colleagues and friends. And they have been, as many others, uh, working on international solidarity. People who have given us much strength to allow us to advance, uh, go forward and get to this point where we can share this victory, the victory of this law that bans uh, metals mining in El Salvador. I remember the origins of this struggle, uh, and this international solidarity was a pillar from the beginning. And I uh, would like to greet and thank all of the organizations in Canada, the United Church of Canada. I remember that around 2005, the United Church already had a great deal of confidence and trust in us, in our association. They had sent uh, a volunteer, an intern from the United Church to be with us, to accompany us here in the country, in El Salvador. And that was so key. Her presence was so key because she uh, supported us in the review of the environmental impact assessment that the company had presented to the Environment Ministry and Natural Resources Ministry of El Salvador. As Salvadorans, we didn't have that access to the corridors of power to speak with the ministry uh, and the minister directly. But she, uh, in her capacity, and because she was an international uh, figure, uh, she was listened to and she was able to get a meeting at the minister's office and carry out a review of the EIA that the company had uh, carried out and presented. And I think that's where it all started, that relationship that was so strong uh, and so deep that we were able to uh, create in this struggle against uh, mining uh, exploitation in, uh, in El Salvador, 2004, 2005. Five. My memory fails me a bit, but it was in those years uh, when we welcomed that volunteer from the United Church of Canada who supported us tremendously uh, in the beginnings of this struggle. Another fundamental aspect uh, of this solidarity was the, the trust and the confidence uh, placed in the organizations on the ground and the communities uh, locally. I remember that uh, 
our uh, agenda uh, defending water was one constructed, built from the grassroots, from the communities, from the or organizations, and at a national level through coalitions. And we had as an ultimate objective to uh, uh, have to see a law passed by our national uh, uh, Congress. And we had various strategies to achieve that. And even though in some moments, some organizations, especially international uh, development organizations, said we need to be more flexible around our objective, that we're not actually going to achieve a decree or a law. It might be easier to uh, aim for something less than that. It's not very possible the government will approve something like that. And we said no. No, in El Salvador, our struggle will be for the definitive banning or prohibition of metals mining. And uh, these organizations then had to accept, uh, in so many words, uh, that this was our goal. And they, they had to respect that. And they decided to do so. And they supported us from that moment on. And throughout the process, throughout the struggle, with funds, uh, with resources for the, the struggle, that was one part. But another important part to underline that I need to mention here today, this evening, is that through this trust and confidence that was developed and uh, this uh, articulation, uh, uh, this relationship that was developed uh, with Canada, uh, Kairos, other organizations. I can't list them all. As I say, my memory sometimes fails me, but there were many Canadian pi partners. I remember uh, Kairos. I, I remember Mining Watch uh, and others uh, who were there uh, from the beginning. And we were able to organize tours uh, to Canada where a number of us went from El Salvador uh, sometimes for more than a month. These tours were coordinated by these Canadian partners. And that's how I was able to bring the word, the message, to a number of different areas in Canada and different levels of, of government and different organizations and present the reality on the ground, what we were experiencing uh, in the uh, Department of Cabañas, in the province of Cabañas, what we, what we were struggling for, and bring that voice of our people, the feelings and thoughts of those directly affected and that was the channel, uh, the, the way, the path that facilitated this voice of uh, being heard and amplified. These trips, uh, I wasn't the only one, uh, I wasn't the only individual who went. Many other colleagues of mine went uh, and left El Salvador and went to Canada, to the United States to tour and to speak. Uh, in the United States uh, in 2009, that was the first time when I visited the United States. And it was uh, specifically because at that moment, as you heard, uh, the uh, Institute for Policy Studies, IPS, was giving this award. Uh, and that's why I and a number of colleagues went to receive this recognition. And so that's uh, those are the various components, the various uh, uh, pillars of solidarity that were uh, built to render more visible, to raise the profile of our struggle. I think our struggle, as Robin said so eloquently uh, before me, would not have been possible. It would not have had its uh, profile raised without the help of international solidarity. So this struggle uh, transcended borders. We had to uh, bring our voice to Australia. Uh, uh, where we dialogued and uh, uh, spoke to uh, to unions, to churches, and said, you know, you there are actions you can actually carry out. Uh, uh, Oceana Gold and other companies needed to be pressured and needed to hear these voices because this company was in part an Australian company. So we brought our voice there. Uh, through these various uh, channels of international solidarity, bringing these messages from the grassroots, from the communities on the ground in El Salvador. And this was significant and was very valuable as part of the struggle. And I have no doubt whatsoever that all of this support uh, uh, in the form of international solidarity, which remained and continued through all of these years of this struggle uh, from 2005 through the 12 years uh, that the struggle lasted was key. And then the strength of meeting these allies uh, in Canada and the United States and Australia and in other countries as well. Uh, 
the richness of these encounters uh, and dialogues, the churches, as I said, uh, and the dialogue with them. Uh, and another thing that I feel was very important in this struggle, this historical struggle of El Salvador, were uh, these pronouncements continually that were coming from uh, allied organizations, friendly organizations, organizations in solidarity with us in the United States and Canada. These uh, uh, public statements in the most difficult moments when there were threats and assassinations taking place, uh, these uh, uh, public statements were came very quickly, very spontaneously, in a very fluid fashion, through communiques, through public letters, letters to uh, the uh, Legislative Assembly of El Salvador, to uh, the Ombudsperson and other uh, uh, agents of the uh, Salvadoran state from the United States and Canada, facilitated that voices be heard, uh, uh, voices uh, that were very courageous and that had been silenced often in El Salvador, and that were able to uh, uh, and also very powerful voices. There were American senators who made statements in support of our uh, struggle uh, during these very difficult years in El Salvador. And I think another uh, uh, aspect that was very powerful uh, was the accompaniment that we received in decisive moments. For example, I remember in these hearings at the tribunal uh, when the hearings were taking place at Siadi. Outside, there were uh, protests taking place. Uh, our various allies and, and American organizations were there in the street. Uh, uh, also at the offices of uh, PACRIM in Canada. Uh, marches were held, protests were held, uh, vigils were held to show the support, to render visible the support that was being offered uh, by organizations and individuals in Canada and the United States for the people of El Salvador through all of these years. And the follow-up, the, uh, the ongoing and continued accompaniment, as Robin said, after, how, what's it called? Uh, after the approval, after the passing of this law, uh, I think there has been an intense struggle that has continued so that we can raise the profile of this victory uh, and show that this achievement, prohibiting, banning uh, metals mining in such a small uh, country. In one of the tours I did to Canada, I remember there was a map uh, on the wall. and. There was El Salvador, this tiny little country on the world map, and I wanted to mark it. And the uh, not even the tiniest little post-it note could uh, fit, uh, because El Salvador is such a small country geographically, and this struggle is very difficult uh, to um, publicize. And, and where did this struggle come from? It came from the feelings and thoughts of the, the very communities at the grassroots that then organized and mobilized themselves nationally. And through these strategies that were used and, and, and successfully uh, selected, you know, the use of social media and other communications uh, uh, vehicles and channels, Especially the alternative uh, media, the alternative media became the, the the voice and the mouthpiece for some of the communities. This whole uh, way of mobilizing, of organizing, uh, achieved uh, uh, and allowed us to uh, position ourselves in a successful way. You know, the Conference of Catholic Bishops of El Salvador uh, came on side. We were able to convince them, and they were, they made public statements against these uh, mining developments. A number of universities and uh, very prominent professors in academia in El Salvador uh, supported us. And so we saw the whole potential and commitment of the communities and how we were able to consolidate support around our struggle. And this has continued. We've always said that El Salvador is a country uh, that can punch above its weight. You know, the slogan 
that we can live without gold, but we can't live without water, that ended up being very uh, successful. Yes to life, no to mining. These very simple slogans and messages uh, went a long way and really helped us to achieve this success. And uh, I would like to recognize that throughout this struggle, we had this support from various allies uh, in different parts of the world who made possible what we achieved and allows us to be here today day uh, and to remember the blood of our martyrs. You can see behind me uh, the photos of Marcelo. Yesterday, the 12th of July, was the commemoration uh, of the uh, laying to rest of Marcelo uh, after 12 days, 15 days uh, after he was found in the well. And so that's why we continue to be involved for Marcelo and for others. It, it is worthwhile to continue to, to defend our territory and our water above all. Thank you so much. Sister Vidalina, these are very important uh, messages that you've shared with us. So, thank you again, Vidalina. And I'd just like to remind people that uh, you're welcome to post questions in the question and answer box, the Q&A box that you can open from the bottom of the screen. And now we'd like to hear from some other key participants from the Canadian and US side of the whole story to talk for just a couple of minutes about what really made this whole thing work from your own experience. What really inspired you or what was one really key element or maybe two? Um, and first is Laura Avalos. Laura is a Canadian born Salvadorian raised in Quebec. And in 2006, she co-founded the Salvadorian Canadian Association of Ottawa, ASCOR CAN, famous for its Pupusa Festival but also a key element in this international solidarity effort. And Laura currently works as the Social Justice Fund Advisor for the Public Service Union, the Public Service Alliance of Canada. So over to you, Laura. Hello, good evening, everyone. I'm gonna do a share screen. Let's see if this works. Share. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, let me see here. If I do this, oh, 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 oh. sorry about that. If you want, if you want to go to slides, I can... yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm uh, because of the yeah the Zoom thingy. I'm not able to. Ah, oh, here, you go. aha, I got it. Yes, all right. Do you see my full screen? Do you see the PowerPoint? Yes, we do. Picture. Yes. Okay. Nothing else? Just that? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. So, Perfect. yes. Thank you so much, everyone. I was asked, it's an honor, a true honor to be on this Zoom with uh, Vidalina and so many of the comrades uh, that we are involved for over a decade in this fight for water, for land, for the protection of, uh, of nature and of life in El Salvador. And I was asked to talk about um, First of all, what inspired us? And uh, I want to acknowledge and share with you what inspired me and my community and dedicate my presentation to all the abuelitas, mothers, padres, fathers, youth, students, compañeros that with their lives fertilized the struggle and paved the way for our successes and gave so many fruits. And especially, uh, I want to dedicate and a thought to Dora Soto, along with her compañero Marcelo. She was also assassinated in 2009. Uh, she was eight months pregnant and she was carrying her two-year-old child in her arms. And back in 2009, when this happened, this is, if this event, this series of political violence, again, environmental defender, water defenders really came to get to our core because we were past the peace accords. We had signed the peace accords, 1992 peace accords in El Salvador, and suddenly, we entered this new phase of political violence in El Salvador, and especially in Cabañas. And my family is from Cinquera Cabañas, very close to where Dora was assassinated. So it really came to get personally to many members of my family and community. And we thought, oh, this could have been easily, if we were still in El Salvador, as farmer peasants cultivating, living off the land, it could have been one of us. 
So I, I, I really want to dedicate this to Dora and all the martyrs and the abuelitas um, that have set, that have planted that seed of popular resistance in El Pueblo, El Salvador and beyond, even here in Canada. So that's inspiration for you. Secondly, I was asked to talk about um, the role and energy that we brought as uh, Salvadoran diaspora in Canada. And I like to use the expression coined by Salvadoran American author, Roberto Lovato. We brought the Salvadoran Jedi power to the table. <laughs> Why do I say this? Because, you know, I was not in 2009 at the right time, at the right place by coincidence. You know, my family, my community, we came from revolutionary uh, comrades that had faced imperialism, right-wing forces, um, American interventionism in, in the civil war, a civil war in El Salvador. So we brought our experience from the 80s, from the 90s, from the early 2000s in building political alliances, um, doing government advocacy, um, doing popular education, and you know what, adapting to a new trinchera, to this front it, it, that we now call home as new Canadians. And as Vidalina said, this was truly a David versus Goliath war 2.0. So we had been there before and we had successes. So we brought that to the table. Um, so th that's why in 2009, when the headline star took him out here in Canada, um, and we learned that the company was Canadian based, um, our board of directors at the time leading the Salvadoran Canadian Association, Ascorcan, uh, we right away understood our role, an important role that we could play in this lucha, in this struggle for the environment and water in El Salvador. So concretely, we had uh, five different roles. Quickly, first, uh, representation and spokesperson on behalf of the Salvadoran Canadian community in Canada. Um, we could be uh, with authority talk to Canadian authorities, government officials, and to our allies. We also secondly had a role in educating and advocating not only our community, but politicians, members of parliament, government officials here in Canada that were uh, not aware necessarily of the details of what was a stake in El Salvador and Canadian investment in the country. Third, uh, by being president in this Canada El Salvador chain of solidarity, we also brought legitimacy to uh, the call for Canadian corporate accountability and its companies abroad, specifically in this case by Canadian based Pacific Rim. Four, we also were able to articulate on behalf of our diaspora actions of solidarity with with. Uh, diaspora, community-based Salvadoran, you know, the soccer players, church groups, folkloric dance, you name it. We involved, behind us, there was all these little groups of Salvadorans selling tamales, signing petitions. We were able to coordinate co and, and reach across Canada. I met Salvadorans uh, from Edmonton, Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, you name it. It was really interesting that we all came together. And fifthly, use our people power. You know, Salvadorans were known to have a strong, strong sense of community, of family, of solidarity, and we're good networkers. We are social people. So, you know, that's how a Salvadoran knows somebody, another one, and everybody knows a Salvadoran. So that's how, en fil en aiguille, I grew up in Quebec. Um, we got involved in the National Canadian Coalition called America's Policy Group that is still around today. And uh, we met amazing organizations that are here on this panel, like Mining Watch, Salve, PSAC Social Justice Fund, United Church. And we ended up sitting at the table as a voice of the diaspora on the International Alliance Against Mining in El Salvador. So these were the ingredients. Um, now, what did we do? You know, we had, we are Salvadorans, we're known to be working people. We don't sit around, we like to work. So concretely, what did we do? Um, well, first of all, we use one of our secret weapons, las pupusas. <laughs> uh, so if you don't know, it, the tortilla, uh, which is filled with cheese and, and pork, more typically, with also uh, beans. Well, anyways, we used our festivals, our platforms, our community-led events to go to our community and raise the issue about what was going on about can a Canadian mining company suing the government of El Salvador and going against the will of the people of El Salvador. How outrageous, isn't it? People between two bites of pupusas and elotes locos said, yes, this is outrageous. Where do I sign the petition? Where can I call my MP? Uh, 
paying more attention about the news uh, about this case that you know covered many years. So our community was very much engaged uh, in in this approach. We also had days of action. Uh, rallies on Parliament Hill, where we joined forces with politicians. In this case, uh, we had allied with Liberal MP John McKay, also with, from the NDP, Paul Dewar, and we had many rallies, uh, and we joined a national campaign. Imagine the Salvadoran diaspora, we were pushing and supporting a private member's bill in, in Parliament in 2010, Bill C-300. Many of us will remember uh, this historic moment. Uh, we supported this private member's bill to bring more accountability for Canadian Mining Corporation. And in this case, uh, using El Salvador as an emblematic case. Unfortunately, the bill was not adopted. It lost by six votes but it was the precursor for what became the Canadian Network for Corporate Accountability and a bigger call later on for Canadian Ombudsperson. And we also had, uh, this is another photo of Paul Dewar at the rally. We also had uh, film nights. We, we rented um, theaters, downtown Ottawa, World Exchange Plaza, and hold movie nights with parliamentarians. We had uh, back then Peter Julian, John McKay. So we, all 2010, we, we were, lobby and do many events with members of parliament, building those relationships, those allyships. We also, in 2014, when Pacific Rim was bought out by Oceana Gold and became Australian, well, we went to the Australian embassy in Ottawa and continued our fight there. We adapted and we even joined forces with the Filipino community because they were also denouncing Oceana's gold mining activities in that country. So it was a, a um, a time of allyship and, and adapting and being creative and bringing our Salvadoran Jedi. In conclusion, because I know I only have a few minutes, um, I think a key element to our success is that, you know, whether we were from an NGO staff and with only two, three people in the organization or a politician or us leaders of our community, you know, we all had, we all respected our different spaces and we, um, we were aware that we had access to different spaces and different people. So it was a very a, a good uh, way to join forces and complement each other, you know. And we also, as the Salvadoran diaspora, we, uh, we speak Spanish, French, and English. So we had those language skills as well. And we were able to build a strategic alliance at a key moment in Canada where people were only starting to know and be aware of the huge proportion of Canadian and investments in mining activities in the Americas. It was, I know for me personally, a very, an eye-opening experience. And I still to this day continue to educate friends and colleagues. So in conclusion, um, you know, uh, finally, the, this, the last element that was truly, that made a difference, I believe, is that as Canadian Salvadoran leaders, Salvadoran Canadians, with having that double identity, Canadian and Salvadoran in many cases, we had double interest in the success outcome, the successful outcome of, the, of this fight, of this esta lucha. So we had double the commitment, double the passion, double the energy. And I think it was uh, spread out and puchica pues, compañeros, compañeros, lo logramos. Así que aquí me quedo. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much. Um, so another key organization in building energy and vitality into this whole effort was another Canadian organization, Salvade. And Rene Guerra was the director of Salvade for much of this period. He was born in El Salvador, but his family was forced to leave as political refugees, and he grew up in Edmonton. Rene is a co-founder of Canadians Against Mining in El Salvador and was privileged to support the Salvadoran anti-mining struggle as part of Salvade for five years. Currently, he works for Oxfam Canada, accompanying feminist gender justice programming in Guatemala and soon in Mozambique and Uganda as well. And as a point of special interest, Rene met his brilliant wife, Emily, during a Salvadoran roundtable against metal mining tour event at the uh, University of Ottawa. So, Renee, over to you. Hello, everyone. Thanks, uh, Jamie. I, I um, wanna say that uh, I may have grown up in Canada, but I'm still quite Salvadoran and asking me to be brief, uh, especially on such an historic uh, social justice victory is quite the challenge, but uh, I'll do my best. Um, before that, I do want to quickly say that it's so, so great uh, to see and hear Vidalina again. 
Uh, I hope that she's forgiven us uh, here in Ottawa during one of her visits to Canada for lodging her in a house with a giant, uh, very menacing dog that's actually quite friendly. Uh, but she was a little bit uh, terrorized after that experience. Um, it's actually also great to m finally meet, quote unquote, Robin and John visually. Uh, all our conversations um, over those years were, were teleconferences, so over the phone. Uh, so this, I believe, is the first time I've seen them live. So uh, I want to tell you, too, that I thoroughly enjoyed reading your book. I encourage everyone to go out and get it. It's a, a great read. Uh, it brought back wonderful memories, and uh, I also learned things I never knew. So thanks to both of you for your solidarity throughout uh, that beautiful struggle. Um, going back to your question, Jamie, uh, there was lots to motivate making this work. Um, Laura has mentioned uh, several things that I, that I share. Um, on a personal level, I would add that specifically as a Salvadoran Canadian, um, indignation was a great motivator. Um, Robin and John do such a great job of laying out how, uh, how ludicrous this Canadian mining company, Pacific Grim's position was um, in the face of overwhelming Salvadoran popular opposition. Uh, and to boot, they wanted to extort a bunch of money, millions of dollars from, uh, from, from, from Salvadoran public coffers. Uh, it was outrageous and, and it, it, it caused righteous indignation. Um, the book actually references a CBC documentary, uh, it was a Sunday edition piece, and some outrageous, racist, uh, colonialist comments made by PAC RIM executives and board members. Um, what, what I'll do, I, I think I'll, I'll post that documentary, the link to that documentary in the chat, along with the report that the international allies produced in response to debunk all of the effectively BS that uh, these PAC RIM executives were sharing in that documentary. Um, secondly, and John and have already alluded to it, um, the relationship among the international allies and between the allies and La Mesa and El Salvador depended fundamentally on plain, simple, resilient solidarity. Um, and by that, I mean, uh, you know, a reciprocal commitment to contribute to the fight within one's means from each person's position, from each organization's position, uh, maximizing the resources that each part had at its disposal, sharing and collaborating without prejudice, which is something that uh, is very difficult to achieve in coalition and alliance work. And I think most importantly, at least for me, um, to always, always, always take our cue from those who were the experts on the front lines in the struggle La Mesa in El Salvador. This last component, I think, is the one that I, I can point to with the most respect as I think about those years. Um, the Allies ensured that the priority were always the experts, the Salvadoran women and men like Vidalina, who stood tall in the face of those white men in suits, as Robin and John's book describes. Um, lastly, uh, I think it's important to mention this from, from the perspective of a member of the Salvadoran diaspora, like Laura and many, many others. Another factor that was vital um, uh, for, for, for us as, as part of the diaspora was really occupying and positioning ourselves as, as actors in civil society rather than as FMLN party activists. Um, and so much of, of Salvadoran civil society in El Salvador and internationally has its roots in the FMLN political military organizations that fought the dictatorship during the, the armed conflict in the 80s. Um, and because of that, it's, it's oftentimes very, very challenging, maybe less so with the decline of the FMLN in El Salvador, but, but it, at the time it was very challenging for diaspora activists to dissociate ourselves from party allegiances. Um, and in this particular struggle, that was absolutely necessary, uh, as we read in, in, in John and Robin's book, whether to allow Pacific Rim to mine gold and silver in El Salvador ultimately did not depend on, on the political party in power in the country. Ultimately, it depended on um, a well-organized civil society, popular movement uh, led by people, amazing women and, and men like Vidalina and many others that leveraged alliances. And even sometimes with the perceived historic enemy as we read in the book, the Catholic church, uh, the ARENA uh, party, uh, ARENA government uh, officials, essentially to get the job done with grace and dignity. So um, 
yeah, I mean, it's, it was historic. Uh, you know, it's it's one of those things, as as Jamie mentioned, it even touched me on a personal level because I met my wife <laughs> at one of the events uh, around uh, campaigning uh, for, for, for this historic victory. So uh, it marked me for the rest of my life uh, on many fronts. And, and I'm just so, so, so happy that uh, John and Robin have documented it so beautifully. And, and I want to thank them again uh, and, and thank everyone who's, uh, who's contributed to this uh, amazing victory. We, we don't have a lot of victories to celebrate oftentimes in the work we do. And this is a clear one that we can learn a lot from. And I, I always say, and I know that I'm Salvadoran, so maybe there's a bit of bias there, but Salvadorans in El Salvador always punch above our weight. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Rene. That was excellent. And now I'd like to turn to another low profile, but key participant in this process. Uh, Jim Hodgson retired in 2000 after serving the United Church for 20 years as its Latin America program coordinator. He had worked previously in Mexico and the Dominican Republic. And the United Church actually had an intern in El Salvador who played a cru crucial role in this story. So Jim, uh, can you talk a little bit about, about your role? Sure, thank you, uh, Jamie. Um, and uh, I, uh, I'm happy to be here tonight and to celebrate uh, in a really meaningful way uh, the, the, uh, the, the tremendous victories that were won uh, around mining in El Salvador, but then also the publication of this book that is just so helpful. Uh, in, in telling the story. Um, I'll try to be brief. Uh, Vita Lina has already mentioned that the United Church was, was a, a kind of a key uh, ally for Ades in those uh, early years of the struggle. And what had happened was back in the, the time of the Civil War, um, some people from the United Church and the Anglican Church in Canada had met people from Santa Marta, the community in uh, northern Cabanas, where Vita Lina and others are from. Uh, they were in exile in Honduras and, and these church folk from Canada connected with them there and then later after their return and after the community had kind of decided to live as if they had won the war, uh, created the ADES as a, a space for supporting community development and health education initiatives. Uh, the United Church began funding some of that work together with some other NGOs in, in Canada, Spain and elsewhere. Um, in 2004, uh, we were doing some work in Canada around water, so we asked global partners of the United Church for their opinions and experiences around struggles to defend water, and Antonio Pacheco, the director of ADES, responded by talking about the, uh, uh, this mining challenge that had emerged in El Salvador. And at first, uh, people were not quite sure what to make of the, the idea of reopening um, an abandoned gold mine, uh, but they looked around. They took the initiative and looked around uh, what, what had happened in Honduras with the Siria Valley uh, San Martin mine and, and what was going on in Guatemala with, uh, uh, well, it became Gold Corps uh, and, and, and other mining experiences and began to understand, well, we have to oppose this. So then they looked at what to, to, what to do. So in that same period, uh, Ades had asked the United Church for some support around its agricultural work, and we found a uh, agricultural scientist whose name was uh, Barbara Fraser, now Barbara White, or sorry, Barbara, my goodness, Heather Fraser, um, now Heather White, uh, and Heather had this scientific background that as the mining issues began to emerge and how intimately they were tied to water issues, she uh, brought that scientific background to bear on the, the mining issue. So when the government did its uh, environmental impact assessment, um, Heather and others were able to look at that and say, no, this needs to be responded to. There was a really tight deadline. Heather went and found a guy named Robert Morin, a, a, a really wonderful man from the United States who had done this kind of work in other places and jumped in and uh, responded to the, the government's environmental impact assessment uh, with his own assessment of that report. Um, and it was so well done that the, the environment minister in El Salvador had no option but to shut down the project in, if I remember rightly, 2008. A whole lot of things happened after that, my goodness, uh, some of the tragedies of the, of the murders. I mean, the, the response from the, the local 
people who stood to benefit from the mine, the, the, uh, certain politicians and so on, uh, w w was just terrible. Um, uh, but the United Church continues to work with uh, ADES with great pride, uh, continuing to support its, its work throughout all, all those years and all the years since. Um, I should mention as well, I, I know that, uh, I think Heather is on, on the conversation, on the call tonight, and also Lenora Yarki. Lenora served with uh, um, ADES after about 2013. There was also another uh, person assigned to uh, ADES in about 2011. That was Lynn McCauley. And unfortunately, she passed away uh, just last year, if I remember correctly. Uh, but but the, they are they are signs of uh, Canadian solidarity with uh, really brave men and women and uh, social movement organizations in El Salvador. It's been a privilege to work along alongside all of them. Uh, thanks for the chance to to talk with all of you. Gracias y saludos a todos y todas allá en Cabañas esta noche. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, so. Now let's hear from someone who's worked on mining issues across the Americas. Jen Moore has been researching, writing, and collaborating closely with the struggles of mining affected communities and allied organizations for a decade and a half. Originally a researcher and independent journalist, Jen coordinated the Latin America program at Mining Watch Canada, a colleague of ours, from 2010 to 2018. So Jen, what would what would you see as the, the key lessons for working across borders, institutions, and, and even organizational cultures to build these relationships? Thanks very much, Jamie. And just, it's really wonderful to be here with you all uh, this evening. And, um, and I think so many things have already been said uh, that I really share. Um, I fundamentally agree with Rene and the importance of, you know, relationships that are built on trust and respect and really, really grounded in local demands front and center. Um, you know, even while these struggles are at once, you know, intensely local and have all these tentacles all over the place that took us to the World Bank and the Canadian mining companies first based in Vancouver and then Toronto with an office in Australia and building all of these connections, being rooted in uh, the local vision and the local demands and, and, and that as an operating principle, I think just is, is so fundamental. And, and I think too, um, I just such big shout, shout out to the Jedi power of the Salvadoran diaspora. These are such long-term struggles and, and I don't think enough can be said about the important role of organizations that have a long-term solidarity relationship with El Salvador. I think we've seen this, um, the importance of such relationships too in the sorts of organizing work that have gone on with communities in, in Guatemala and other parts of Central and Southern South America. Um, but, but I just think that, that that energy and that love and that dedication to, to a country and its people um, is, is fundamental to sustain, to sustain these struggles over the period of time that, that they take. And, and on a personal level, um, I just wanna say thank you to Heather White as well. <laughs> um, my first exposure actually to the struggle in Cabañas was, was also thanks to Heather. I don't know if she remembers, but um, before I even imagined working for Mining Watch, um, I was working at a community radio station in Guelph, Ontario, CFRU 93.3 FM. And, uh, and I remember meeting Heather coming through talking about uh, what she'd learned and uh, what urgently needed to be shared about this, uh, about PACRAM at the time and the terrible threat that it was posing to people's water and, and health in, in Cabañas. And, and that was the first seed that was planted uh, for me. And, and I think, um, I just wanna touch on a couple of other pieces. I think the importance of creativity to also sustain these struggles. Um, the, and, and another big shout out to the Mining uh, Injustice Solidarity Network in Toronto. I think, you know, the, your street theater demonstrations and that street theater on Bay Street in Toronto back in, I think it was 2015, um, when, 
one of you remember, I can't remember who was it, dressed up as a kangaroo and uh, demonstrated against the kangaroo court at the World Bank. And uh, I remember Jim was there and we had Yanira there from the Human Rights Office in El Salvador. And I believe um, Marcos, if I'm not um, incorrect from Criptas in, in El Salvador. And those things that just give us energy, give us energy and are, are the, um, the images and are the the sorts of messages that we want to be sharing with with just a broad public about what these struggles are about and really coming together, and and then just the importance of of relationships again. Um, that I think one of the things that mining justice networks have done well, in addition to long term relationships, but is building those ne those networks widely and. Um, the one story that I don't think we've touched on yet, um, and that came up towards the end of the, the story and the end of John and Robin's wonderful book, um, about after the arbitration, after Oceana Gold lost its arbitration suit against El Salvador, space opened up for uh, Salvadoran partners to mobilize again for the ban against um, all metal mining, the ban on all metal mining. And the long standing relationships that amongst the international allies, not only in El Salvador, but also in the Philippines, where Oceana Gold has operated for decades. Um, it's the Dipio mine, which has been very destructive uh, on the communities there, um, meant that we were able to facilitate um, the visit of the government, the governor of that province, uh, where Oceana Gold has its mine, uh, to El Salvador. And um, Catherine Cummins, who works at Mining Watch, and Robin and John, who've spent many years working in the Philippines, um, had these relationships and uh, were able to mobilize this connection um, to, to send the governor, along with his engineer, to uh, El Salvador to debunk these claims that Oceana Gold was spreading in the country about how it would, would carry out more responsible mining than Pacific Rim ever could. And, and as I recall, and perhaps uh, John and Robin could correct me, um, I don't think we could have quite predicted or planned just how good the timing was going to work out for that visit when we started organizing it. Um, but it ended up being sort of a serendipitous and really vital contribution in the final debates over the mining ban um, and the power of hearing directly the first hand accounts uh, from the governor and his, his engineer about uh, the real devastation that the Didipio mine had had caused in in the Philippines um, on the eve of the, the the historic passage of the mining ban in El Salvador and and I think as I understand the results of which have also very much fortified the resistance in the Philippines um, and Oceana's Gold's failure to renew its operating permit there. Um, so I think just a real testimony in these struggles to, you know, what what can happen and and the importance of what can happen when when we build these long term relationships uh, based on trust and respect, uh, really grounded in, in local demands. Thanks. Next, Jen. And I want to go now to uh, actually a colleague of yours now, uh, Manuel Perez Rocha is an associate fellow of the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, and also an associate of the Transnational Institute in Amsterdam, which sounds physically awkward. Um, he is a Mexican national who has led efforts to promote just and sustainable alternative approaches to trade and investment agreements for two decades now. He's also a regular writer for Mexico's La Jornada. So Manuel, can I ask you to uh, give us a, a couple of minutes of your thoughts? Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Jamie and all. And I'll try to be brief because we have it over the time. But it has been a real honor in my life to be a part of this history and of this book indeed. I think one of the elements of success is that we had an overarching struggle with shared objectives. And as John said, a horizontal collaboration among organizations in the North and Salvadoran organizations. But I don't want to repeat what many have said. I agree with so many uh, conclusions that many have arrived. But to me, a key element was also having a narrative that combined the local concerns in El Salvador with global ones, like the struggles against the free trade agreements and particularly the Trans-Pacific Partnership at the time, 
and also against uh, all the campaign, the global campaign against investor state dispute settlement and investor rights in these agreements. And, and, in part and also uh, how this helped to accompany many other suits against other countries in the world. And of course, the relation it has with all the activism um, around tackling climate change. So this meant that a real diversity of groups from environmental to labor all around the world could engage with the issues from a diversity of entry points or, perspective, or perspectives. These are the opportunities that the struggle of Salvadorans gave us. So it was not only the international solidarity towards them that was important, but how Salvadorans taught us globally with their struggle on how to continue fighting all these fights. So we weave together the strands of a narrative connecting water, health, and the local defense of resources and territory to the imposition at the global level of corporate power by means of instruments such as free trade agreements, investor state demands, and the World Bank's International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, the infamous ICSID. But now let me show a few slides of the strategies of our work since we met with La Mesa in 2019. Um, ba, 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 ba. And let me just share my screen. Am I sharing my screen? I, no. Not yet. There? No. Uh, still not yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just going to conclude. I think I'm going to pass them another time. I have a technical difficulty here. But our strategies center around research, publications, forums, advocacy, mobilization, protest. Um, and we have many, many different strategies here. Am I there? Oh, there you go. Oh, yes. Excellent. Do this very rapidly, so, not, so as not to eat too much time, but you like to see the photographs. This is Vidalina Morales receiving the Letelier Moffitt Award in 2009, in 2009 from IPS. On your left, you see Representative Mike Michaud, and on the background, four of the La Mesa uh, allies or uh, friends that came to receive with Vidalina the award on the far right is Miguel, the brother of Marcelo, who had very recently been assassinated. Uh, then we formed international allies against mining in El Salvador and we started our work. And here you see a little bit of the constellation of different organizations that we work with, a little bit in concentric circles. In the center, you see Mining Watch, CL Institute for Policy Studies, but then so many other organizations that worked with us in this journey. Um, we held forums. I like to highlight that we've both had them in very, at a very community level. There you see John and Robin with Vidalina. And on the right, you see Jen at a more like a posh hotel in San Salvador, speaking to the press, speaking to NGOs, and a few policymakers that showed up. Uh, we did advocacy. There we are, the Canadian Embassy in Washington. And this is the fat cat that John was talking about in a wonderful protest outside of the World Bank where Pidalina was with us. This is Fry Jacek. He came all the way from his church and all the people from CASA. CASA is a migrant um, organizing organ uh, organization for uh, Salvador and mainly, but only all of the Central American people. And a big solidarity, big solidarity tours, many of them. This is in 2013, more than 40 of us went down and to El Salvador and we were here outside of the Pacific Green Mine, protesting and making ourselves shown. And of course, research, you can look into the internet for these documents, debunking eight falsehoods by Pacific Green Mining um, Oceana Gold in El Salvador, and also had a study about the falsehood of the supposedly philanthropic activities of um, Oceana Gold in El Salvador. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Manuel. And um, that's great to. Great to see some of those pictures and see all of this happening. You know, I think it's it's a it's a bit of a memory for some of us, but it's it's also I think helpful for for everyone to see that the kind of diversity and and as as Jen mentioned the the creativity, um, the energy behind all of this that that, I, that you know as was said is was really key to making things happen. Um, 
so the, we have a few people here um, who I think will be really good to have a, a few comments from. We've only got a few minutes left in the time that we'd allocated, but I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Heather White, uh, uh, whom Jim had mentioned, and uh, Jan Morrill, who's also in the middle of this for, for many years, uh, working for the, the, uh, the National Roundtable, the, the Mesa Nacional, um, and also Leonora, who, uh, who Jim had mentioned. So if, um, if any of you would like to add some comments, that would be fantastic. Just, you know, what, how did that happen? What, you know, what really, hi, Heather, what really made a difference, you know? Hi, I am, um, may I speak? Go ahead, please. Yeah, I'm just thrilled to be here. This is such an exciting, uh, exciting time. I, I have the book. I read it very quickly. And uh, I guess my two thoughts would be, uh, as I was mentioned, I was there 2004, 2005, when everything was just a seed. And uh, I think the lesson that I carry from, from that experience is that sometimes you just don't know how things are going to turn out. Um, I remember in, uh, in the book, you capture that forum that was had towards the end of 2005, where masses of people were brought in from both sides and there was a panel up front. And when you were sitting in the audience, you just, it was a tangible tension where you didn't know you could just sense that there were people who felt strongly on both sides at that point. And, and at that point, you just didn't know that this right now would be the celebration that we would be, we would be having. And that um, I'm, I'm one page 57 in here. Uh, and as you can see, there's a whole book full of people um, that everybody has also mentioned came from all over the place, brought their particular skills, their particular strengths. Um, and uh, a fearless work of, of coordination and vision and hope. And I don't know, I don't want to use the word faith necessarily, but that the impossible, the audacity to believe the impossible uh, that Vitalina talked about um, and to keep striving for it is just so inspirational to me. Um, and that uh, in, in different ways and different struggles where I am now, I, I try to keep that seed of hope uh, in me. And uh, for that, I am uh, in, in gratitude to uh, many people, including those Salvadorans, some of whom are, are here tonight. So uh, thank you very much. It's a thrill to be here. Fantastic. Lenora or, or Jan? Would you like to add something? Sure. Thank you very much. It's, it's a, such an honor to be able to speak with so many impressive, inspiring people tonight, and I really appreciate it. Um, I just have to say, I, I did smile when I said, when I heard Vinalina say that she gained strength from international solidarity, because I think she's probably one of the strongest people I've ever met in my entire life. And to think that she needs to get strength from anywhere else, but her inner core is, uh, was interesting and a little funny to hear. Um, but I think, you know, I don't repeat what's been said tonight. I think it's been a wonderful overview. Um, I would just say I was, I was in El Salvador from 2008 to 2013. I was working um, at first with communities organizing in Chalatenango, which is a region in the northern part of the country that was also confronting um, gold mining and silver mining companies. And then I transitioned to work um, directly with the Mesa in helping coordinate between international allies, um, like all of the fantastic folks that have already spoken and the organizations on the ground. And I think one thing that I would just highlight is um, the commitment to building understanding from the ground up, both internationally and in El Salvador, was really important. And, um, you know, Jim mentioned that communities went to Honduras to see the Valle de Siria mine, but also, um, you know, communities went to Eastern El Salvador to San Sebastian and saw the historic contamination that gold mining had already caused in El Salvador 
in the 60s and 70s, 80s and 90s. And I think that was really key because there's the difference between seeing something with your own eyes and hearing about it from other people, right? And so that experience of seeing and understanding and, and talking to people who had had lived experience was, was really important. And then we were able to um, also do that on an international level as well by connecting international folks with, with groups on the ground. Um, and, and so I think, um, you know, Renee talked about the plain, simple, resilient solidarity. I, I, I love that. And I would say um, because the Salvadoran social movement was so rooted in um, organizing, educating, listening to and uplifting communities, um, the civil society organizations that supported them made it easy for us to find the messaging, the direction, and um, the strategy that we needed to be effective internationally. And it was, it was always really, it has been such a pleasure to play a tiny little part in some of this work. And um, thank you for the, the time to be here today. Thank you so much. And then thank you for all that you've done. And Honora, uh, Jim mentioned you as, as well as, as one of the, one of the people that, that carried on with the coordination and that the, the really, I won't say invisible, but but really below the radar work of, of connecting people and informing people and um, making things work in a way that, that I think is, is often uh, unappreciated in, in these kinds of, of situations. Thanks, uh, Jamie. And uh, truly, thank you to everybody here. Um, the, the book and uh, all the organizations, both uh, around the world, but particularly in El Salvador, I think we're really showing that international solidarity right now, right here. And that's great to see. I'm from Edmonton. I was in El Salvador for a year, 2013 to 2014. Um, had the pleasure of living in Santa Marta and uh, sharing, having Vitalina share her office space with me. Thank and grew to, to know and love her very, very much. When, G when the United Church sent uh, uh, companiers, um, I really wondered what my, what my role would be. It's like, so Jim, what am I really supposed to be doing here? Well, you're accompanying and you're building relationships. And I thought, well, that's something I can do. Yeah, um, and it was uh, truly wonderful. Such that the impact from how they worked, uh, how they how people treated each other, um, just ordinary people getting on the bus to go to a rally and me just going along with them and, and walking with them, listening to them, hearing from them, not coming with, quote, all the answers, unquote, as an international, but truly being there as somebody who was to learn, but also to take back what I needed and, and tell Canadians about it. And not only Canadians, uh, when I traveled to other places, I started doing that as well, telling them about it. Um, I will say that one thing that's come out of it for me is that more recently, I was in Guatemala at the uh, San Flores, uh, the, the mine uh, just across the border uh, in Eastern Guatemala, and uh, who are also struggling with, uh, with issues there and with uh, uh, murder attempts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I mean, this all continues, of course, in the Philippines and other places as well. So, um, uh, what I've learned, I'm trying to bring to other places. But I truly am most grateful to the United Church, to all the organizations here, to uh, John, and to um, I'm sorry, I forget the first name of the author because I haven't bought the book yet. <laughs> thank you so much for all of this, and just thank you, everybody. A pleasure. Thank you, Lenora. Um, and thank you all. Uh, thank you to our, our audience. Uh, this is such a rich discussion and I, I hate to have to bring it to a close, but we are at an end of the time that we had allocated, um, but there's so much to explore and learn. Um, I'd like to ask all of our panelists to come back on camera, if you would because I'm going to propose a toast to Marcelo Rivera. And because Marcelo did not drink alcohol, but also because the whole struggle 
this whole struggle was about the water. This was about uh, clean water, adequate water supplies, um, you know, the, the, the sanctity really of, and the importance of, of water in our, our health, our ecosystems, and the, the sacrifices that people made to defend the water. It is the title of the book, The Water Defenders. And so I'd like to propose a toast in memory of Marcelo Rivera and the, all of those who, who have struggled in this, in this long and remarkable story. Jamie, can Marcelo. I say one thing in half a minute? Manuel, dale. Solamente un aviso, que el libro va a salir en español pronto. Ya tenemos un arreglo con una The book is about to be published in Spanish. We have arranged it with the Mexican publishing house. It's being arranged. It will be in Spanish. Thank you. Cheers. Salud. Cheers. To life. Life to water. You're all invited to Washington to demonstrate in front of the World Bank anytime you want. <laughs> <laughs> and they've relocated this tribunal exit across the street from the Institute for Policy Studies. So you can you can no. hang out at IPS <laughs> and demonstrate during the day. Very, very so convenient. <laughs> very convenient. So I, again, thank you very much to our guests and especially to the co-authors of the book, John Cavana and Robin Broad, and a reminder that the book, The Water Defenders, How Ordinary People Saved a Country from Corporate Greed is out now from Beacon Press. Uh, there's a link in the chat, but you can also find it easily enough, I think, online. And if your local independent bookseller doesn't have it in stock, they will, I'm sure, be happy to order it for you. Um, special thanks also to Vidalina Morales for joining us from El Salvador. And a very special thank you to our interpreters, Marta Singh and Michael Cardi. And again, I'd like to thank all the groups that have endorsed and supported this discussion and this, and this long process. We saw Manuel's uh, schematic there of, of all the groups, but we've got a, a long list of groups that, that uh, came on board to, to help support this event and, and to support the book. It's a long list, so it's, uh, you'll see it in the chat again. And, and remember, if, um, if you're not already plugged in, you can keep informed and perhaps more importantly, engage in more discussions on these topics by connecting with these great organizations, whichever ones are closest to you or closest to your own focus, your own work, your own interests, to carry on with this learning process and, and to carry on building a better future. So thank you all. And I, I, I think we have actually addressed uh, most of the questions that were posted in the, in the Q&A. So uh, if there's anything left over, feel free to communicate with, with me at Mining Watch or uh, I think probably anybody here. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and good night.